drive-in service. Thank you to everyone who joined us for worship out at the woods. This Sunday, we have the special privilege to welcome our new senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Anthony McPhail, his wife, Emma, and their two children, Everly Kate and Asher. We are so excited the McPhail family is joining our church family. We are so glad you have joined us for online worship this morning. We pray that you will be filled with the Holy Spirit through worship today. And I encourage you to take a moment to share the love of Jesus Christ with someone that you encounter this week. Be blessed. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And we do so at this time by singing hymn number 369, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. One of his spirit, wash in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Good morning, I am Lee Tarpley. On behalf of the Staff Parish Relations Committee of Vows to First, I'm pleased to introduce you to the Reverend Dr. G. Anthony McPhail, Jr., who has been appointed to serve as our senior pastor. Anthony was born and raised in Macon, Georgia, and for the past four years, he has been the senior pastor at Centerville United Methodist Church near Warner Robins. Prior to Centerville, Anthony served eight years at Martha Bowman United Methodist Church in Macon, and he is married to his wife, Emma, and they have two children, Everly Kate and Asher. We believe that Anthony is well qualified and has been prayerfully appointed by Bishop Lawson Bryant. Anthony, you've been sent to live among us as a bearer of the word of God, a minister of the sacraments, and a sustainer of love, order, service, and discipline ship of the people of God. Today, I reaffirm my commitment to the presence of you and this congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as people committed to participate in the ministries of the church by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service. I ask you to celebrate this new beginning with Anthony and support and uphold him in, this, in these ministries. Let us pray. Eternal God, strengthen and sustain us in our ministries together. With Anthony as our senior pastor, give him and us patience, courage, and wisdom so as to care for one another and challenge one another that together we may follow Jesus Christ, living together in love and offering our gifts and talents in your service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Anthony, accept this Bible and be among us as one who proclaims the word. Amen. 
Anthony, take this water and baptize new Christians in this place. And Anthony, take this cup and keep us in communion with Christ and his church. Amen. This ministry has been laid upon me, and I willingly take it upon myself. Let's pray. Creator God, you have ordered all things and called them good. And you have ordered the life of your church. And we ask that as we step out to lead this church in this season and this life of ministry, we pray that you would order our steps, give us your wisdom, grant us your grace, that we may live in fellowship and love with one another, bringing honor and glory to you each step of the way. Pray this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. to receive somebody in a wonderful and friendly way. It means to say, come on in and treasure that time with them. What if you go to somebody's house, you might see a welcome mat that says welcome or some other phrase on it. You might see a sign hanging from their door that says hi. You might even get a warm plate of fresh cookies offered to you. How about new movie premieres? Special guests sometimes go down a red carpet when they are welcome. Well, let's talk about this. Do we welcome everybody into our home? Do we welcome people that look differently than us? Do we welcome people that act differently from us? What about church? Do we welcome everybody into our church? What about visitors? Do we take time to go speak to the visitors? Or what if somebody's dressed differently than the normal church going crowd? Do we go welcome them? Jesus said, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. So what that really means is that Jesus wants us to welcome everybody, and if we don't welcome everybody, then it's like refusing to welcome Jesus, and we wouldn't want that. So today, let me make sure that you decide to welcome all people with the purpose of for God. And today and this week, let's make sure we roll out a very special red carpet for our new pastor, Dr. Anthony McPhail and his wonderful family. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit, whom we worship with reverent lips, but too often with insensitive hearts, 
Grant us today a vital experience of your saving presence. Don't just be a holy name reverently spoken, but a living reality within our souls. Shine in us like the sun returning after the rain. Clarify our thoughts, elevate our spirits, deepen our faith and courage, and send us out to lay fresh hold on life because you have laid stronghold on us. O oh, holy God, you are the sovereign, the supreme ruler, the one who determines the king of kings. You are in charge, and we are foolish to think otherwise. Father, sometimes it's difficult for us to transfer our convictions into real life. We think our opinions matter as much as the decrees of your word. We are tempted to create a separation between spiritual truth and our daily lives and responsibilities. But as Christians, we are meant to live out our faith in the trenches and routines of life, to take the word of God out of mothballs and put it to work. We are meant to hear the word and then do the word. And although doing the word includes worshiping on Sunday, it's just as rele relevant when we are at work or at home the other days of the week. Lord, as a church family, we have many needs. Some of us are hurting and need your strength and aid. Others have lost family members or dear friends who are headed for a Christless eternity. Some of us are struggling with finances, health, shame, our marriages, our children. Others are fighting enslaving addictions. Some are depressed, worried, fearful. We have difficult decisions to make and sometimes choosing between just lesser evils. We need your wisdom, your direction, and your spirit's power in our daily lives. Help, help us to experience that abundant life you promised in your word. Loving Lord, we are so blessed to have the McPhails, whom we believe you brought to our church family. This is a day of new beginnings. Thank you for Anthony and Emma, Everly Kate and Asher. Bless them in their time with us. May our hearts be bound together with each other and with you, God. Make us co-laborers together with you for the transformation of the world beginning right here in Valdosta and in our families. Send us from our worship here in our homes and in this sanctuary and at the woods to worship in the world in which you've placed us. So strengthen us within and by your spirit that we may be your disciples facing the future, yes, facing our future with steadfast hope in you as did Jesus in whose name we pray saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To echo what we shared earlier during the welcome liturgy with Lee Tarpley, I just want to say that we are so excited to be a part of this church and to be in ministry with you. Now, I say in ministry with you because even though I have been called to be the pastor of this congregation, it really takes all of us working together to fulfill our mission and to bring glory to God as we seek to reach the community around us. If we were gathered together in person in the sanctuary this morning, this would be the point of our service in which we would receive the morning offering. Now, we're not gathered together in person. We're hopefully working towards that in the next few weeks. But we do want to remind you that we all partner together in ministry by offering ourselves 
We do that through our participation in the church by offering our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And so I want to continue to encourage you to support the church in those ways and all of the different avenues that we have available. You can always pray for your church. You can be present even if it's in an online platform. You can continue to support your church by mailing in your gifts, by giving online. You can be in service by, by still being in ministry, by keeping in touch with other church members, and also by your witness, how we share with the world the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so as we get ready to hear some beautiful music for our offertory this morning, let us come humbly before God and offer ourselves and our gifts to the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have blessed us so richly, and we thank you for the gift of being a part of this great and wonderful congregation. We ask that as we come offering ourselves and our gifts to you, that you would receive them and that you would use them to further your kingdom purposes through the ministry and the mission of this, your holy church. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
Well, I just have to share as we get started with our message this morning that this is an exciting day for our family, and, and hopefully it's an exciting day for this congregation. We have been looking forward to this day for so long, we had hoped that it would be with other people in the sanctuary, other than me and the camera guy, Davis, but we are still so glad to be a part of this church community, and this is an opportunity that we cannot wait to be a part of. Now, I share that with you because I imagine that you have your own hopes, your own hopes for what God might do through our time together as my family comes to be a part of your family and we seek to be in ministry together. Now, as we come to our message this morning, I just wanna share with you yet again, we are so excited about today. Today is a day that our family has been looking forward to for the past several months, as we knew coming to be a part of Valdosta First United Methodist was an opportunity that we had before us. I had hoped that we would all be together in person in the sanctuary today, but we're gonna wait a little bit longer for that, and we look forward to many worship services with each one of you here in the sanctuary at Valdosta First. But I am excited about this, and I know that many of you are excited about the opportunity that we have to be in ministry together. And as we begin our time, I wanted to invite us just to reflect for a few minutes on the simple idea of amazement. Amazement is one of those experiences in life that many of us have lost sight of in the world in which we live today. We can Google the answer to pretty much anything we want. We can find the answer to any trivia question that might be on our mind. Science has come so far that we have so many answers that we did not once have at our disposal. And so amazement is something that we do not always experience on a regular basis. Life can be somewhat ordinary in the midst of the world in which we live today. But amazement is something that is full within the scriptures. It's full within what it means to be people of God. And as we begin our ministry, as my family comes and is a part of this congregation, I am hopeful that we will experience some amazing things together in the years to come. And I believe, based on the conversations that I've had with many of you, that you are hopeful and hoping that God will do amazing things through the future of this church. And so today we're going to talk about that idea of amazement. And I want to invite you just to think about how we can experience amazement in our lives as we worship together, as we are in ministry together, and as we seek to be alive together in Christ with one another. Amazement is something that we do not always put into practice in our lives. And I have found that I have to force myself to experience amazement from time to time. Amazement is one of those experiences that can drastically reorient your life. I remember the amazement of getting a phone call from my wife, Emma, the day that she found out we were expecting our first child. I was in the middle of doing a job evaluation for someone who worked at the church I was at at the time, and she kept calling. We were in the middle of eating lunch, in the middle of the evaluation meeting, and my phone keeps ringing, which is code for, help, answer the phone. And so I went and answered the phone, excused myself for a few minutes, and on the other end of the line, she shared the news with me. Then I had to put on a nice straight face, walk right back into that job evaluation, and try to get through it, because it was one of those experiences that was so filled with awe I knew it was going to reorient my life. Amazement has that power about it. It can simply reorient your life. That child, now we know as Everly Kate, we decided we would not find out her gender before she was born. So many people today, they have these incredible, fun, gender reveal parties where they declare to the world what they are expecting when their child is born. And we decided, you know what? we rarely have an opportunity to be truly amazed. Let's wait and find out when she is born. Well, we didn't know it was a she at the time, but we found out in due time. And boy, were we amazed. And boy, did that, not boy, girl, did it reorient our lives. Amazement has that power about it. Now, in the story we're gonna look at today, 
from the book of Acts, we find a story that is full of amazement. But it happened in a rather unusual circumstance. We'll talk about that in a minute. And it's an incredible story about God doing something amazing, and it reoriented the lives of those that experienced it. And so I want to invite you this morning to hear this scripture reading from Acts chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 10, and then we'll have a couple of citations from later in the chapter as well. Hear now God's holy word. Peter and John were going up to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the established prayer time. Meanwhile, a man crippled since birth was being carried in. Every day, people would place him at the temple gate known as the beautiful gate so he could ask for money from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he began to ask them for a gift. Peter and John stared at him. Peter said, look at us. So the man gazed at them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I don't have any money, but I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. Then he grasped the man's right hand and raised him up. And at once his feet and ankles became strong. Jumping up, he began to walk around. He entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the same one who used to sit at the temple's beautiful gate asking for money. They were filled with amazement and surprise at what had happened to him. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, within this story, we find a few pointers, a few details that point us in the direction of amazement. The first details that stand out to me in this passage is that Peter and John simply expect the amazing in the midst of their ordinary routine, yet this beggar is not expecting much at all. And here's what I mean by that. It tells us right there in the first verse that Peter and John were going up to the temple at three o'clock in the afternoon, the established prayer time. They were simply going about their business as devout Jews, going to the temple at the time of prayer, simply observing their daily rituals. And yet they had such a belief and such a confidence in God and in the power of the name of Jesus that even in the midst of their ordinary lives, their ordinary routines, they still expected that something amazing could happen. And yet we have the beggar who is not expecting more, much more than just a simple handout. He's not even, we can infer from the text, not even looking up because Peter has to address him and say, look at us to get his attention. He's simply sitting there, gazing down, hoping for a handout, hoping to make it through the day and not expecting much else. But there's a hinge within this story that without this particular hinge, we would not have the amazement that comes on the back end of the story. And here, here's where we find that hinge. In verse six and seven, Peter says to him, I don't have any money, but I will give you what I do have. That phrase right there, what I do have, I believe is the hinge of this entire passage. And then he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. Then he grasped the man's right hand and raised him up. And at once his feet and ankles became strong. That phrase right there, what I do have, is the hinge of this entire story. Peter didn't focus on what he did not have. He instead chose to focus on what he did have to offer. How often in life do we focus on what we do not have rather than what we do have? There's a great fine restaurant right in the heart of downtown Atlanta, next door to Georgia Tech's campus, and they serve fine foods covered in chili. It's a great place known as the Varsity. And when I was growing up, we would go and enjoy the varsity on our way to Atlanta Braves games. And then when I became a college student, I spent my college years up in the North Georgia area. It was a, a quick, easy trip for a group of friends to go and enjoy some time right before a Braves game 
by enjoying the varsity and their hot dogs, their hamburgers, their fries, onion rings, frosted orange, all, all of the fixings. And so we would go and experience this fine dining experience right before we would go to a sporting event. And there's a question that they ask. It's all of you who are English professors and majors and, and, and critics of English grammar being malpractice. You'll have to bear with me on this one. But the question goes like this. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? And, and they say it repeatedly when you come up to the counter. They go, what do you have? What do you have? And there's one guy in particular who used to work at that downtown location who would do it with a little bit of a hand slap on the counter. And so if my friend group ever saw him, that was the spot we were going. And he would sit there and go, what do you have? What do you have? What do you have? And he would start pounding the counter. And we would just get on each side of the person who happened to be ordering. And we would join in the fun. And we would be screaming at him as well because we wanted to, to raise the intensity of the moment. And I've thought back on those experiences over the years of being asked, what do you have? What do you have? What do you have? And I thought there are so many ways that I could answer that question. Because it's easy for me to focus on what I do not have. And so if someone's asking me what I want to have, there are many items that I could come to mind that I would want to have, that I would want to experience, that I would want to have in my possession. I am so often consumed with what I do not have instead of what I do have. Peter and John, in this moment, they could have focused on what they did not have. They did not have the financial resources that this man was asking for. The, the old English version of this says, silver or gold have I not. Beautiful phrasing there. They could have focused on that. But instead, they had something more powerful at their disposal that could make a difference in this man's life. And so they did not withhold. Instead, they gave it freely. Peter looks at the man, says, I, I do not have what you're asking for, but I'm not going to withhold what I do have. And what I do have, I give freely. We could do an entire sermon on the response. The response is incredible. The man gets up, he's jumping, he's leaping, he's healed instantly. It's, it's a fantastic scene filled with joy and, and with hope. We, we could spend the entire sermon talking about how we ought to practice that in our lives. When we see God do something in our lives, we ought to be filled with that joy and excitement and praise. Or we could also spend the entire sermon talking about how the crowd responded. They were, yes, amazed at what they saw God do in this person's life that they had seen time after time sitting there begging because he was unable to move and unable to provide for himself. But the hinge of the story is not on the response. It's on what happened in that moment in which Peter gave the man something that would reorient his life and change him forever. And it all began with him saying, what I do have. Now, the temptation of every church is to focus on their limitations, to focus on what they do not have, rather than the freeing miracle and life-giving statement found in that experience of saying, what I do have. Churches sometimes will focus on their limited resources. We, we don't have the money we, we once had, or we don't have the people we once had. In, in today's climate and culture, Oftentimes, we're lamenting that we cannot gather like we normally do because of everything going on in the world as we fight this pandemic with COVID-19. And people are lamenting what we do not have. But there are many things that we do have. And the story of Scripture is not about God doing amazing things and amazing us because of our abundance that we bring to him. Instead, it's when we bring yet a humble offering before God and God blesses it abundantly. That's when lives are changed. It's when we say, this is all that we have to give, but we trust God to make a difference with it. 
As I think about the story of Jesus' life and his ministry, there were moments where there was a great crowd gathered, and all of the Gospels tell this story of how people were hungry and they were all gathered around, and they only had a few food items, a few loaves and fishes to share with the crowd, and yet they all ate, and there was a surplus left over. There was, there was one night that the disciples had been fishing all night, and, and they did not have any hope left. But what they did have was the instruction of Jesus to throw that net to the other side. And when they did, God did a miracle because they were willing to listen in that moment. And there was a man who had a tomb that was unused, and God did the most incredible, amazing miracle because that man offered a tomb that would only stay filled for a few days. And then God raised Jesus from the grave. Life is filled with these stories of what we do have being used for abundance, for blessing, and for the power and amazement of God's kingdom. And so the question for us is what do we what do we have that we can use, that God can use, to bless abundantly and make a difference through our church and through our ministry? I think about just a few things that I've observed so far about this congregation. When we found out we were coming here and the congregation found out as well, we started receiving all these wonderful messages from people. I can't tell you how many cards and emails and phone calls and text messages and Facebook friend requests, all of those different forms of communication that we have encountered along the way. And there was a resounding theme that we found in a lot of those messages. And it went something like this. You will find our congregation is so warm and loving. Our congregation is such a, a warm, tight-knit community. Our congregation will welcome you warmly. And there was that theme of warmth over and over and over again, which was fascinating because as our friends found out we were going to Valdosta, they wanted to remind us over and over again how hot it was here. So whether it was within the congregation or within our friend group, everyone wanted us to know that there was a heat index that was a part of this congregation. I'll choose the warmth over the heat. I like the congregation, not necessarily the heat that we're experiencing so far. But we have found that to be true so far, just such great love and, and welcoming spirit that we have encountered as different people have come to help us unpack. They have welcomed us with food, with messages of, of love and of kindness. And so we have that as a congregation. We also have just some incredible leaders and, and staff members that are a part of the church. There are great staff team that, that's already in place, ready for the next chapter of ministry for this congregation. There are lay leaders that are engaged, that are excited about the future, that are working hard and diligently to make the best decisions for the future of the congregation. So we have a lot in terms of the resources that are available to us and those that are leading us into our future ministry together. But there's one more thing that we have. And it's actually at the hinge of this entire story. We have a name to proclaim. We have a story to tell. We have a name that is so powerful that a few verses after this story, Peter is explaining to the crowd and saying, his name itself has made this man strong. That is because of faith in Jesus' name that God has strengthened him. And we find that what we do have can lead to ultimate amazement in our lives, ultimate amazement in our congregation, and amazement in what we can see God do in our community. And it all begins with us asking, what do we have? Not what don't we have, but what do we have? As we see all that God has blessed us with, and most importantly, that God has blessed us with the name of Jesus Christ, who can turn a, a lame man into a walking, jumping, leaping man. When we encounter that name and we proclaim that name, 
and make that the focus of our ministry together, I believe we will be amazed at what God will do through this church and through our lives. Amen. At this time, let us join our hearts together in singing hymn number 370, Victory in Jesus. into our week and into all that God will lead us into. May we be truly amazed by God, by the miracles that we will experience even in the midst of our ordinary lives. May we be expectant and may we be blessed and may we be amazed. Amen. <laughs>